This is Sifu David Ross, and welcome once again to the Lion's Roar. I'm not sure how long I'm going to take with this. This is um, sort of popped on here. Um, but I don't know. Uh, today's uh, the, it's the Memorial Day weekend. So maybe it's a good topic to talk about. Um, just came up randomly. Um, as you know, a lot of these things are things that just sort of pop up and I just decide to discuss. So um, I, I was discussing uh, with someone this aspect of Chinese martial arts. And it made me think about a lot of things. Um, as people know that have uh, interacted with me, and um, if, certainly if you've read my my book, uh, Chinese Martial Arts, A Historical Outline. We talk about how um, Chinese martial arts um, has a, a military background. I mean, you know, I've talked also at great length about how, you know, it goes from organized military, like battlefield kind of combat down to like uh, a village militia level and then down to like personal combat. And, you know, most of what we practice now is uh, in the, the the personal combat kind of stuff, you know, uh, the, 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 the Kun Fa and in Vietnamese, the, the Twin Fa, you know, um, but that, that military background is there. And so it shouldn't be surprising, I guess, you know, when you stop and take that all in that, um, you know, it, they kept aspects of, um, military training. And for example, I, I mentioned, I, I'm starting to do the second volume of the history book. One of the things I've been talking about is, for example, um, the Jian, you know, what we call the straight sword, um, actually sort of fell out of use with the, the military, the battlefield military, but obviously among civilian martial arts, it was kept on. So in other words, aspects of, um, you know, uh, organized military, uh, remain, um, in the quote unquote civilian martial arts. And so, um, you know, I made this comment offhandedly and somebody took a huge insult at it. Um, you know, I said Chinese ninjas and they said, well, in Chinese, they're not called ninja. I, I get that. You know, I mean, I, I certainly speak enough Chinese to know that Chinese and Japanese are two separate languages. Um, but you know, this idea of, and, and again, what do we talk about when we're talking about, uh, quote unquote ninjas? Um, this is how sort of I got got into this, but I'm going to get uh, talk about it in in a larger scheme. But just to sort of know how I got this in, um, somebody that a, a friend of mine knows pretty well. I mean, I saw the, their a video about them, and then I said to the person that I know really well, "Give me some background on this person." We ended up in this long conversation about it, and um, as in most things, like um, when you dig through all of it, um, you know, um, you may not. Uh, you may have a different take on it. You may be looking at it from a different direction. But if you unpack it all, you probably have things that are more in common than different. And unfortunately, on the Internet, with little short comments, I mean, my comment was two things. One was, you know, oh, they're Chinese ninjas, and that person took tremendous offense to that because, you know, like I said, they were Chinese or not ninjas. And my other comment was about um, the term oriental, which in my neck of the woods is, is not something that we use anymore. That's neither here nor there for this discussion. But... Uh, again, what are ninjas? Certainly, they're not Shokuzuki movie ninjas. Um, you know, um, and, and I would argue it's it's not like a system, like, you know, ninjutsu, uh, a system, like the way that we think of systems right now. Um, it is in the military, in the defense of a nation, um, there are going to be times like we have our, we have our military, right? Our standard battlefield military, which are, you know, the the generals and the soldiers that go on the battlefield and fight. But there's always going to be people that are going to do um, more clandestine um, things. I mean, we, we have special forces. We have, uh, you know, the term wet work in, in intelligence circles. Um, you know, uh, for a very long period in history, ideas of, like, uh, assassinations were, were, were statecraft. I mean, now we, we come from a different perspective and, you know, like... We, Things, but there's no question that in the realm of military as a larger thing, there's going to be the need for a certain kind of clandestine, you know, a, and and secret services kind of thing, you know, like um, intelligence, counterintelligence, um, sabotage, um, uh, you know, these kind of things. And it, 
it doesn't take much to um, imagine that, you know, every nation that has had a need for military, and that's going to be every nation, has had a need for this kind of thing. Now, um, this particular aspect is not really one of my areas. So, I mean, I, obviously they all have it. Um, the questions will be like, well, you know, did the Japanese get it from the Chinese? Um, was it independent? I'm not going to go into that. And uh, I honestly don't have a lot of experience in this, and so I'm not going to talk about that. But I'm just going to talk about that aspect of it, which is that clearly these techniques uh, filter down to the level of what we're talking about, which is civilian martial arts. And I, I experienced this directly. Um, Chantai San and also Zheng Xinping, um, very different people from different parts of China. Um, Zheng Xinping went to Taiwan and remained part of the nationalist, uh, you know, uh, apparatus. Um, Chantai San was originally a nationalist and then, you know, got captured, re-education camp, and then served with the communists. Um, but two wonderful examples of traditionally trained martial artists who then had careers in military and Zheng Xiaoping, Zheng Xinping, Zheng Xinping also, you know, obviously police, but in the Asian context, police and military are much closer than maybe we think about here. And here they're also, you know, somewhat related, but, but in Asia, they're certainly much more closely related. And Cheng Dongsheng, obviously, um, you know, who's Cheng's teacher, again, traditionally trained martial arts person that then, you know, made his entire career in military and, and police apparatus. Um, so, I guess when I put this on YouTube, um, I'll put up a picture of, I guess, the official or unofficial weapon of Chang's military version of Shui Zhao. A lot like an all May dagger, um, you know, which is like a kind of needle with a ring on it. But it's got a little hook on it, and um, the reason for the ring is not like in contemporary Wushu, where they see people spinning them, um, you know, for a nice effect, but rather so that if you stick it in and you can't pull it out of the body, you, you know, the ring helps you pull it out of the body. When I met Chao Tai San, um, one of the famous stories I tell is that when I first met him, he walked around with a briefcase, and in that briefcase was a fragmentary grenade. I don't know where he got it, um, don't want to know, and don't send me messages saying, how do you know? I saw it, and I knew what it was. And I don't know anything beyond it. And at the time, I thought it was, you know, very strange that he had it. Um, but also in the time that I spent with him, you know, we talked about um, various apparatus that you could build that clearly aren't like your sort of standard Chinese martial arts stuff, like uh, shoes that had blades in them and the blades could pop out and uh, shooting darts out your sleeves and, um, you know, things that would best describe as bombs and things like that. Um, and clearly this was stuff that if you were in the military had direct application. Um, and like I said, you know, this stuff in the uh, curriculum, you know, the central Goshu curriculum that got into the Shui Jiao that also is not your standard, you know, civilian Chinese martial arts. These things exist. And if you've trained with real teachers, I'm sure you've experienced them to one degree or another. I certainly experienced them quite a lot and didn't have much interest in them. Um, I mean, part of Chinese martial arts is, you know, throwing stuff. And I, and I learned at one point how to th throw, like, you know, again, you know, that term ninja. You know, people hate hate that, I guess. But, you know, those, those stars that are associated with the ninjas and uh, various spikes and, uh, and other thrown things. And, of course, you know, uh, Chinese martial arts has always been closely tied to, to, to herbalism. And so there's the discussion of poisons and there's discussions of things like this sort of related to this also. Um, when I first started teaching and I started putting together material and I was doing a lot of cross training and obviously people know I did a lot of cross training and stuff like Western wrestling and Western boxing and Muay Thai and uh, Japanese submission fighting and stuff like that. I, I also sort of got interested because I had done a little bit of Filipino martial arts, but um, in, in looking for truth, um, I think I sort of told this story, which is that, um, 
the way I first found out about Shuto, uh, the Japanese, you know, uh, submission system, which ultimately led me to train with Eric Paulson for a bit, um, was actually from the fact that we rented the school to the Dog Brothers. And so I became, you know, actually aware of the Dog Brothers before I became uh, aware of the, the whole Japanese MMA scene. But um, I wanted to learn stick and knife stuff, and I was interested in obviously finding the stuff that worked, uh, some of it obviously. And I don't think uh, any of my friends in, Ch in Filipino martial arts are getting too upset about this. Some of this is mired down the way that other traditional martial arts is in like overly intricate patterns and, you know, unrealistic patterns. I, I wanted to, you know, kind of cut through that, and the Dog Brothers is a good way to do that. And um, I've mentioned many times before they have a program called Die Less Often. You know, underline the die less often, not, you know, guaranteed 100% to save your life, which is um, some anti-knife defense. And it's gone on to, like, I think four or five volumes at this point. And a lot of it's also, like, um, you know, like uh, using, you know, a firearm and firearm retention and uh, firearm integrated with blade defense and things like that. And the point I'm going to make here is that at some point I said, well, I'm not. A police officer. If I was, I'd probably be very interested in some of this stuff. Um, I'm not in the military. Um, I'm not particularly training people specifically for military or for, you know, uh, police work. And, you know, some of the stuff also, I mean, there, there's a point, I don't know if it's in the Die Less Often or if it's another video clip, but there's a video clip where they talk about, you know, you've taken the knife away and now you have to decide, like, how seriously do you want to respond now that you have the blade? And, um, you know, they said this is serious stuff because you're going to have to live with the consequences for the rest of your life. And it was sort of that moment that I said, well, I'm going to sort of stick more to the civilian martial arts stuff. So from my in initial perspective, you know, thinking about people that are interested in this aspect of Chinese martial arts, this, again, I'm, I'm using the term Chinese ninja, you know, just so we sort of understand that we're talking about, you know, clandestine uh, activities, training, you know, uh, special forces, military training, you know, a very specialized kind of military training. Um, some people were obviously interested and I decided I was not that interested in it. Um, you know, and it's funny because I've, I've said numerous times, you know, I, I don't uh, have secrets, I don't hold things back, but it doesn't mean that there isn't things that I know that I don't teach. Um, and I do some, you know, self-defense stuff. And, you know, I've talked before about uh, self-defense is sort of a slippery slope. And, um, you know, uh, you have to caution anybody that comes for a self-defense training that, you know, there's a lot more to it than it first initially is. Um, avoidance and de-escalation is probably the most important thing because if you go into the actual uh, physical part of it, then it's a whole, you know, different, different story here. But, um... What I'm saying is that I, I decided I didn't want to be involved in that. Um, and I questioned, you know, and again, my mutual friend said, well, in the other person's circumstances, it, it made sense to be interested in this stuff. And then when I saw it from that perspective, I said, okay, at least I understand why they're interested in that um, because they're not a military person. But that's neither here nor there. And again, it really doesn't have anything to do with it. But for, for my particular use, you know, my particular point of view, it just is not something I wanted to get involved in. And, you know, my, my friend made the counterpoint, well, if you're talking about what are you going to use in everyday life, well, you know, a lot of the, the Chinese weapons that we do are, are, you know, are, again, remnants of organized military battlefield training that's not even relevant for battlefield training anymore. And I said, yes. I mean, and again, if you were going to really uh, twist my arm behind my back, I would tell you that the four basic weapons, um, you know, being staff, spear, straight sword, and broadsword, um, I think there's you could still justify training those because uh, staff teaches you stick movement, um, even a short stick movement. It teaches you how to manipulate any kind of long weapon. Spear shows you that if you have like a a long weapon that has any kind of attachment, whether it's a blade or a a, a hook or you know things like this, and the Chinese weapons, there's so many of them. They always talk about the classical eighteen, but there's much more than eighteen. Um, spear will teach you that. Uh, Broadsword will teach you any kind of like hacking and slashing kind of weapon. So, you know, the words, uh, you know, uh, meat cleavers and, uh, you know, um, slashing blades, those kind of things. And Jin, you know, straight sword will teach you um, uh, 
knife fighting, you know, particularly what I think is if you're going to do knife fighting and you have to realize really quickly is that not a lot of blocking. You want to kind of intercept and cut the fingers, hands, wrists, and arms with the blade, you know. And um, I'm sure people that, you know, do more GN, like uh, Scott Rodell and stuff, would have tons of comments about this. So, I mean, and the rest, as I said to my friend, I did tons of things, you know, Guando and Tiger Fork and Gick, you know, uh, which, you know, most people know if you know the history of the G, you know, the, the halberd. Um, I've, I've done so many different weapons, and I just, you know, meh. I just... You know, I, I, I would maybe do the four if somebody, you know, was sticking with me in the long haul. But I'm not really, you know, and again, I'm not really doing knife. I'm not really doing stick. I'm not really doing, you know, chains. I mean, we, uh, there's a nine-section whip and a three-section whip. And Chantai was particularly good at the three-section whip. And Chante San, being Chante San, had real occasions to use the three section whip, even at the time that I knew him. Uh, you know, even in recent memory. But that was his lifestyle. It's not the lifestyle that uh, I live and most of my students live. Um, I have a few people that are in law enforcement, and um, I, I've shown them some things. And even the basic program is like the basis, because, you know, it's the same thing. Like, well, how did we get empty hand? Because there was some empty hand in. Weapons training, and some of it, you know, confers over. And actually, you know, when we're doing the shui jiao training, we so we're doing separating hands. Um, my student, who's a, is very interested and involved in Filipino martial arts, in addition to training with with me and our our stuff, you know, I said, well, look at the crossovers. Oh yeah, yeah, it's coolie crossovers, and you can see it. You know, it's uh, the separating hands, which are used for a quote unquote wrestling match, can also um, you know, have have trans transition and translation into defending against a knife. So it's a basis, it's a foundation. Um, and I would say even years and years and years ago when I was still thinking I would try to offer like the most comprehensive training you could ever possibly do, I would say, well, then there's foundational training and then there's specialized training. And of course, obviously, police work is specialized training. And in Shui Jiao, you know, they have the, the basic Shui Jiao and then they have the Daibushu, which is the specialized applications for police use. And I'm I'm still doing some of that. Um, you know, it's kind of a specialized china. But again, I'm not really interested in exploring that sort of complete. I, again, it's out there. There's information on it. Um, it's certainly still being practiced and still being taught. And there are Chinese teachers that know it. But it's just not something that, you know, I, I don't want to, you know walk around with uh, a dart up my sleeve and uh, a blade in my, the sole of my shoe. Um, and Chante San, you know, being especially who he was and doing what he did, we would only sit in certain parts of restaurants and there was a, a correct, quote unquote, correct way to hang up your jacket and hang up your, your hat, you know, to, to not expose yourself. I remember he once he said that, like, if you hang up your hat and you raise your arm a certain way, somebody could run up and stick you underneath the underarm with a, a blade. And I remember thinking, like, I'm not aware that anybody in this restaurant is looking to assassinate us. But again, in the context of his life, it made a certain degree of sense. But I, I just, again, this came up, um, this is military stuff. Um, so like I said, it might be appropriate for the fact that this is Memorial Day weekend. Um, if you are a, a policeman, uh, you know, a law enforcement officer or in the military, this is something you maybe want to look for. Um, and like my friend said, in other parts of the world, um, situations are different and you may need to do more training related to this, you know, less uh, civilian slash recreational. But um, to me, it's always like a slippery slope. Um, kind of the way I feel about the way, you know, internal was, you know, it, it, in one sense, it's okay to like, you know, incorporate Dao Yin, you know, and have a health aspect, but we saw what happened, you know, because you bring in sort of uh, quasi or pseudo religious terms from the Dalian, and then, you know, you become sort of religious. Um, I know people that uh, were interested in yoga, myself included, I was very interested in yoga. And there's a lot of good things that can be incorporated from yoga into your martial arts training, but uh, 
um, try to stay away from the quasi pseudo religious and you know the it, it leads you towards supernatural and I think the same thing if you're you know spending too much time throwing darts at you know uh, wooden cutouts of people um, I don't know I just I don't know how I feel about it and I'm not sure that I, you know I'm gonna say it's positive or negative but um, it, it's out there we should acknowledge that it's there um, regard I should say also that regardless of whether uh, you believe that uh, each culture develops their own methods or there is some influences um, and I think like for example in Asia there's going to be always influences because China was just the center of everything and had such a, a powerful culture that sort of you know bled into other cultures and politically you know bled into other things I don't think that's too crazy to think that something that was developed in China might have influenced something else but um, my point being that it's not that hard even to look in the historical record and see sort of this clandestine services stuff in Chinese military traditions um, it's not really something to argue about it just is and therefore it's not surprising that uh, Chinese martial arts many of whom did have relationships with the military um, which is kind of interesting also, I mean, you know, we always think about the drip down, but then there's the the, the, the movement up, you know, for example, I mean, uh, as I'm writing the second uh, volume, um, Chinese martial arts begins, I, I would argue, from the drip down, which is organized military, down to uh, village militia, down to civilian, but then once civilian martial arts started developing, for example, more empty hand, um, it was out there, and military people became interested in it. So, for example, when you look at General Chi's book, and he's, uh, you know, he says, well, these empty hand things are not really uh, directly applicable to battlefield combat, but they're good for conditioning and stuff. And then you look at the, the Shobu, you know, um, manuals, and they say, you know, uh, this empty hand training for the military is, again, just to prepare the body to move the weapons. It's not directly. So it's, it's always a two-way street. So, for example, uh, people leave the military and then go develop martial arts and then stuff goes back up, uh, back into the military in Chinese. And, you know, so uh, there, uh, you see, like, for example, in the 20th century and, you know, in the 19th century even also, they went and recruited civilian martial arts to come in and train the troops and stuff that had been developed among civilian martial arts um, back and forth. But it's, so it's not surprising that, you know, any aspect of the military, including this sort of clandestine stuff, um, would end up in um, Chinese martial arts. And like I said, you know, um, if I saw it, I'm sure other people have seen aspects of it. And you look in the Kung Fu movies, um, there's, you know, hints of this, more than hints of this, you know, flying darts. I mean, even, even in my first book, you know, we talked about the um, uh, the four staffs, and one of them is the escort, and uh, they were often known by the dart that they threw, the biao, you know, the fei biao. So, you know, this this is not like a huge um, shock. It's, it's just sort of sitting under your nose. But, you know, it, it, what I'm talking about tonight is, uh, you know, where we want to place this in our modern practice. This is David Ross. Thank you once again for tuning in. Have a pleasant evening.